You are now listening to episode 24 of the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. In this episode, Dr. Taylor covers how to build a bulletproof immune system, part one. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. But first off, I just want to say, you know, thank you guys for being here and good morning. Is everybody happy to be here on this Saturday? Can I get a good morning? Good morning. Nice. That was actually really well timed and in, in unison. So everybody is on point today and ready to learn how to build a bulletproof immune system. And that's really the goal for today, right? We're going to talk about everything that we can do to build a bulletproof immune system. A couple of the themes that we want to go through, though, before we start getting into any content, and what we're going to be really talking about, and the importance and the value of the immune system, okay? And your immune system is really your body's natural defenses, right? Does everybody know, know that? Are we coming in with that knowledge that your immune system is your defenses? And now, what are we defending against? We're defending against invaders like bacteria, viruses, pathogens toxins, all these things that can have a negative impact on our health, the immune system's job is to defend against it. Okay, and so the first theme of the day today that I want to talk about is that the immune system is incredibly complex. Okay, so we're going to go through some of the science and talk about some of the, the players in the immune system, but when you really get into it, it is incredibly, incredibly complex. And so you can look at it from a big picture uh, viewpoint, right? And that's like saying, you know, we have an army, we have a navy, we have a marine corps, right? And we know that we have these groups of our defense system, but as you get going, as you dig deeper into this, you know, maybe I've seen one too many Jason Bourne movies and things, but as you dig deeper into this, you find out that there's all these branches of the government and of the defense system, and you know, there's spies, and there's this, and there's that, and there's all these things that, that we know nothing about. Right? And that's how a lot of the immune system is. You don't need to know a lot of these fine details, the biochemistry, the neuroimmunology. You don't need to know those things to understand how to create a healthy immune system. So that's the first thing that we want to we wanna grasp. Okay? Does everybody get that? The first thing, that the immune system is incredibly complex. Number two, the second theme before we get going is that this is a, a life or death thing here. Right? A healthy immune system is literally a life or death thing. And it might not be today, right? but it is a life or death thing. And I say that you know, with a heavy heart because within the last 36 hours, I lost a family friend to cancer. Right? And so most people in here have probably experienced that through a family member or a close friend. And we know that cancer is an immune system dif dysfunction. So whether we're talking about cancer or MRSA, or even just you know, chronic colds and sickness weakening your immune system can lead to an early death. Then there's things like autoimmune diseases. There's all these conditions that can shorten your lifespan. So this is literally a life and death topic here. Okay, so the first one, the first theme is that the immune system is incredibly complex. The second one is that it is a life or death situation. It is a very serious topic. But the third one, the third one is the best, is that the third one is that you can rest easy, that there's hope, right? You don't need to know, you don't need to live in fear. You don't need to live in fear that, that it's a life or death situation today. And if you do the things that we're going to talk about today, you can rest easy and hope and rest in hope and know that your body is amazing, right? Can we all agree with that? Everybody say yes if you know that your body is amazing. Yes? Okay, so do we all know that? Many of you are patients here, so I hope that you all know that, that the body is amazing. And if you're doing the right things, if you're giving your body what it needs, you're giving it the right building blocks, you're doing the right lifestyle things, you can really minimize your chances of ever coming up with one of these immune-related diseases and keep yourself healthy and well. Now, once you've gotten sick, sometimes it's very, very hard to correct these things, but it's not that difficult to keep a well person well. And so if you're, one of the things we're gonna be talking about today is a lot of prevention. How we can prevent things like colds, like flus, like fevers, and things that we can do to build a bulletproof immune system from a prevention 
standpoint. What we're going to do is we're going to talk the first part of today, we're going to talk about five hot topics that are immune related. Okay, so you can see those on your handout. We're going to go through these five topics and just touch on each of these topics to go into a little bit about the immune system. Then we're going to break for about 10 minutes. Then we're going to come back and then we're going to get to the meat and potatoes of the talk. We're going to talk about the 10 action steps that you can do to build a bulletproof immune system. The 10 things that you can do that you can leave here today and you can start doing and your immune system will be stronger because of it. Sound good? Okay, so the first thing that we're going to touch on is what, how does your immune system work? What, how does this defense system work? Because it is important that you have a general knowledge of what the immune system is doing so that you know what you're strengthening and you just have a more general knowledge of, of, of what what we're talking about today. We have to start with the background of how your immune system fun functions, what the different players are. So you really have three layers of natural defense in your immune system, okay? And the first layer, and down here you can see all the, the logos for all of our different layers of defense. And you can think about this, you know, this is a big picture view. You know, like I was just saying, our defense system is incredibly complicated from a governmental standpoint and from an immune standpoint. But really, we know that we defend our country via air, sea, and land, right? So we have three defenses, three ways that we guard our country. There are three ways, three defense systems, three layers of defense that we guard our bodies with. The first one are physical barriers. Can somebody shout out an example of a physical barrier? Skin, that was quick. That's the biggest one, of course. And that's the way that a lot of these things are transmitted through hand-to-hand -hand contact, through, you know, we want to, they talk about wash your hands, we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, they actually did a study where they compared antibacterial soap to just normal soap, and they turned out to be the exact same, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's the first one, is your skin the most obvious one? We'll talk about those. Number two is the innate immune system. That's the next thing that's going to attack, okay? That's your built-in, inborn immune system. It's non-specific. Anything that's bad that comes in, it's going to attack, 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 attack. Then the third is the adaptive immune system. And this is the immune system that has a memory that remembers a sickness. So you get chicken pox when you're a kid, you're not going to get it again. This is also the immune system that a vaccination or an immunization is going to artificially try to stimulate. And we're going to talk about that, exactly how that, how that works and what they're trying to trigger with the immune system and how it also, you know, in some cases may not work. Um, but those are the three layers of your natural defense system. So the first one are your physical barriers. You know, I put these pictures up here of some old castle walls because you know, back in the day, that was the first barrier. You had to get through the wall before you could get into the city or the village, right? So that was the physical barrier It kept people out. Another physical barrier, you know, geographically is an island or you can dig a moat, right? You can have a river around your castle. But in our body, it's things like the skin, the number one thing that's protecting us from the outside. The job of the immune system, or the job of the body rather, is to let the good in while keeping the bad out. And so what the immune system does is when the bad gets in, its job is to attack it. But the first layer of defense is to just keep the bad out. So that's things like your skin, things like your lungs, you can breathe things in. This is any way that a microbe, a pathogen, a virus, a bacteria is going to enter into your body. What are the ways that it could possibly get in? Well, through the skin, through the lungs, you could breathe it in, right? You, through the ears, it doesn't go to very, very far in there, but it goes right into your throat, right? But something can get in through the ears. Then it can go in through the eyes. You can get an infection, you can get hazardous things in your eyes. Things can enter your body through the mucous membranes of your eyes. Nose and throat, those are probably the two most common. When we talk about the immune system and talk about you know, the fevers and flus and colds and boosting your immune system to avoid those things this year. Uh, ears, nose, and throat, because they're the most commonly infected or affected when you get one of those uh, diseases. Then the last one is the digestive tract lining. This is the most important one. Okay, so when you eat, all your food has to pass through your digestive tract. So what that is is from the moment that it enters your mouth till the moment that it exits your body. So including your mouth, including your esophagus, including your stomach, your intestines, that whole lining, its whole job is to let the good in 
good being vitamins, minerals, nutrients, enzymes, all the things that we need for building blocks, that we need for health, and keep the bad out. And bad being toxins, pathogens, bacteria, virus, all these things. So the skin or the gut lining, that's one of the biggest things that we're going to talk about because it's your body's really first line of defense against the foods that you're eating. So that's number one, the physical barriers. If something gets through a physical barrier, then it's going to be attacked by number two, and that's called your innate immune system. And innate, this is one of my favorite words. This means God-given or inborn, right? So this is inborn. You have a, your body has an innate intelligence, right? It's so smart. It's, you know, think about all the millions of things that are happening at every given time. There's, there's so many things that are amazing. That's an innate intelligence. You don't have to think about it. You don't have any control over what your hormones are doing right now or what your immune system is doing right now. The innate intelligence is running that. And a part of that innate intelligence is your innate immune system. Every uh, animal, basically, and plant has an innate immune system that's inborn that's going to attack bad things. This is uh, evolutionary. This is the most rudimentary of our immune system. So the innate response runs the show, though. This is what runs the show. This is what controls everything and what's going to really dictate your body's immune response and how strong it is. Because it not only is the initial attackers, but it also activates and regulates the quantity and quality of the adaptive immune response. And that's the next one that we're going to talk about, but that is stimulated and regulated by the innate response. So without an innate response, there's not a proper adaptive response, okay? So we're going to talk about that when we talk about vaccines why that's important, because it skips over the innate response and goes right to the adaptive response. So this includes things like inflammation. That's the first thing, okay? And so you can picture this as, uh, you know, if you scratch my hand right now, the first thing that's going to happen, this is kind of like, you know, if we stick on the theme of, of military and defense, say something, uh, an, a disaster happened in Salt Lake and we started, we had riots. They're, they're rioting in the streets. Well, who's the first people that they're going to send? The Salt Lake police, right? And the Salt Lake SWAT team. One of our patients is on the, a member of the Salt Lake SWAT team. He would be one of the first people sent right away to neutralize the situation. Now, if the situation kept building and escalating, the riots were uncontrollable, eventually they're going to bring in the National Guard. Right? Well, that's your adaptive immune system, but the first responders are the SWAT team, and that's inflammation. Inflammation is the very first thing that's going to happen when you get a damaged tissue from a bacteria, from a virus, or from an injury, from a cut, from a scratch. So that is the first thing. Inflammation is a healthy response. Now, you may have been here before and heard us talking about inflammation in a negative response and how it fuels disease and how it's the root cause of heart disease, of cancer, of diabetes. That's chronic inflammation. If the inflammatory response, that first response, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. You know, if we just keep the SWAT team fighting all day, every day, they're gonna burn out, right? And they might even turn on us. They might get ticked and start turning on us. That's called autoimmunity. But this inflammatory response, it's, it's, it's acute. So when something first happens, this is the first response. Now, if you just keep this going, keep it going, inflamed, 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 that's chronic inflammation, completely different problem, and one of the biggest problems that there is with our health today is chronic inflammation. But right now, we're talking about acute inflammation being one of the first responses. The next one is the complement system. And what this does is it's actually named the complementary system because it actually complements the immune system ability to kill viruses and to stop the replication of viruses. This is things, the, the inflammatory response, the complement system, and leukocytes, the white blood cells they're going to send, they're going to stimulate things like inflammation, things associated with it like redness, like itching, like heat at a scratch, or even heat as in a fever. This, this innate immune response is what's going to regulate your fever response, and that's what's going to cause an initial uh, response of an increased heat. The leukocytes that are going to, going to attack right away, so leukocytes, fancy word, white blood cells, and like I said, you know, you don't need to remember a lot of this. We're going to talk about the science here, but the real meat and potatoes is going to be at the end when we talk about what you can do. 
But the leukocytes, there are like things like phagocytes, mast cells, eosinophils, basal cells, and natural killer cells. And one of those, the most important one, the only one that I want you guys to remember with the innate immune response is called the macrophage, okay? Because we're going to be talking about it later. So phage, just a, a little background, means to eat. Like your esophagus, you, it's to, to eat. So who's, uh, raise your hand if you've played Pac-Man in your life. Okay, so that's a, that either, either a lot of you are very underprivileged or borderline, uh, you know, being neglected or you're not awake yet, but only about a quarter of the people raise their hand. But Pac-Man is basically a macrophage, okay? Pac-Man goes around and he eats those little white things. That is exactly what a macrophage does in your body. No exaggeration. You watch an a, a electron microscope video of a macrophage and it looks exactly like Pac-Man. So that's what a macrophage does. So when we talk about that later, I want you to think about you know, a good guy eating a little bad guy, Pac-Man being the good guy. So that's number two, the innate immune response. Then after that, so that's short term. That's the first thing that's going to happen. That's your body immediately starting to attack something as soon as it gets in. Now the longer term response is going to come from the adaptive immune system. So these are special leukocytes, special white blood cells called lymphocytes. What do we think of when we hear the word lymphocytes? Any guesses? The lymph, the lymph system. We've all heard that. We're going to talk about that specifically because the lymph system is so important to your immune system. But these are lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes, they circulate things like B cells and T cells, and they alternate between circulating between the bloodstream and the lymphatic system. So they kind of go back and forth and clean up bad guys. Um, and this is, the, this is the immune response with a memory. So this is something like we talked about, you know, you get chicken pox once, you're not going to get it again. Your body is going to remember these diseases through the adaptive immune response. So the thing like B cells and T cells include uh, killer T cells, helper T cells. Um, they regulate the adaptive and the immune um, and the in adaptive and innate immune system, that is your last response, the adaptive system. Okay, so those are your three layers of defense. Your physical barriers, your innate immune, immune response, and your adaptive immune response. All three of those are going to be attacking at once when you have something that your body doesn't want in there. It's not ever going to be one or the other. They're just classified differently just for classification purposes. It's not one works while the other's taking a break. They all work together. Okay, so that is the responses. Here's a, just a picture of some of the cells, uh, some of the cells that are involved with this and how some of them work with both. Some of them are just specifically innate. Remember the macrophage, that's the Pac-Man and the adaptive, uh, your CD4 and CD8. Something important there is just remember that later in the day we're going to talk about a study boosting CD4 counts. Uh, so that's something that we can remember there. But here are the most important components of your immune system. So besides the skin, besides the, the ways that things can enter, once something gets in, how do we attack it? Right? And so these are things like the lymph system. Okay? The lymph system a lot of these things that we're talking about, tonsils, adenoids, spleen, appendix, they're part of the lymph system. They're components of the lymph system. So these are all the organs, and not all of them, but these are the biggest players in your body that are helping this immune response. So the Peyer's patches, this is actually in your gut lining. This is lymph tissue in your gut lining is what a Peyer patch is. Bone marrow. Bone marrow actually produces your blood cells, your red and white blood cells, some of your white blood cells, but your red blood cells that actually help your body fight everything. That's why something like uh, multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the bone marrow, is such a devastating immune system disease because it destroys the thing that's helping your body produce basically soldiers to go out and fight your battles for you. Uh, the thymus. That's, does anybody know where the thymus is? Yeah, right, right about here, right in the middle of the chest. So there's a lot of things like uh, acupressure points and tapping techniques and things like that that are supposed to be right over the thymus because they stimulate thymus activity, it creates uh, T cells. Uh, tonsils and adenoids. How many people have had their tonsils and adenoids removed? Yeah, so I'm one of them. I've had my adenoids removed twice, actually. And a lot of people say, well, how is that possible? How can you have them removed twice? I don't know. <laughs> That's just what they told me. They grew back. So they grow back. Your body is innately intelligent. You take out a piece of the immune system, it might grow back if it wants it. 
Okay, so I've had them taken out twice. And a lot of people, a lot of these organs, you'll see that these are some of the most commonly removed organs, right? Spleen can be removed, appendix can be removed, tonsils and adenoids can be removed, but in my opinion, no organ should ever be removed, right? Your body, like I said, is innately intelligent and everything works together. And you can't take out one part and expect it to not affect all the other parts. You're messing with the intelligent design of the body. But these are the major players. And then the last one, the gut barrier, my favorite one. I'm gonna kick this back up a couple degrees. So the special focus, we wanna have a special focus on the gut lining because have, have, raise your hand if you've heard that 70% of your immune system lives in your gut. Have you guys heard that? You've either heard it from me or you maybe have heard it on a, an Activia commercial or um, you know, there's other probiotics even that have major commercials now because there's a lot of funding going into this because they're realizing this is really the key to health. Your digestive tract with all the food that you're eating, that is your number one barrier to let the good in, the nutrients, the minerals, the vitamins, let those in and keep the bad out, keep the toxins out. So that gut barrier is what establishes that. Now when you have a good gut barrier, it's kind of like a screen on the window, right? It lets the good in, it lets the cool breeze in, but it keeps the mosquitoes out. Right? But if you, have a, if you have a leaky gut, if you have what's called a leaky gut, which comes from things like too much sugar, things like toxins, antibiotics. <laughs> antibiotics is a huge one. This can destroy your gut lining. And it's kind of like if I went up to your screened in porch and I started poking holes, just poking a bunch of holes. And then eventually, you know, if there's a lot of mosquitoes, if you're down you know, below, near the equator or something, that's gonna be a huge, huge problem. You're not letting the good in and keeping the bad out. You're letting them both in. And that's exactly what happens in your body. The reason that 70% of your immune system lives in your gut is because that is your immune system. That's what's called your G-A-L-T, your GALT tissues, or what's also called your gut-associated lymphoid tissues. Those are your Peyer's patches. And that's your lymph system that resides in your gut. So your lymph system, any guesses on how many lymph nodes you have? I don't expect anybody to get it, but shout out some numbers. Millions? Millions? Too high. <laughs> Next guess? We have three guesses. Somebody shout out a number. 500. 500. Two guesses because she nailed it. 500 to 700. And she gave both of our guesses. You guys are not participating very well today. <laughs> 500 though, Denise, so that is exactly right. 500 to 700 lymph nodes, okay? The places where they're the most heavily concentrated, neck, right? Because your throat's through there, you, that's where you're initially taking in your food. First area of defense, neck. Your groin is a big area, and your armpits, big area. And then your gut, your gut-associated lymphoid tissue. The lymphatic system is the key to your immune health. So what we're going to go into now are five hot topics when it comes to immune health and talk about each of those uh, just a little bit, touch on each of these because these are hot topics that you read about a lot. These are hot topics that are, you know, a lot of people are very strongly opinionated about. Uh, but we're going to go and just tell you, you know, some of the facts, some of the research, and also share with you my opinion on them, which is all based on fact and research. But we're going to go through each of these topics and just talk about why they're popular, why they're even, you know, some of them controversial. So the first one, fevers, colds, and flus. This is the biggest one when you're talking about boosting your immune system. You know, we all, everybody should want to prevent cancer, right? But what people really are thinking about, they're not, most people just don't think that long term. They're thinking, well, I don't want to get sick next week. And a lot of people are thinking, well, I'm already sick. What can I do to get better? And unfortunately, a lot of times when you get a fever, you get a cold, you get a flu, once you got it, you got it. And, you know, my dad, he, I always talk about my dad that he can prescribe antibiotics. So I, was, I had a life of antibiotics growing up, but he'd always say, you can take this antibiotic and it'll get better in seven days, or you can do nothing and it'll get better in seven days. Um, so the, a lot of these things, we've just been misinformed with a lot of these things. But fevers, colds, and flus, that's the most common thing that we're talking about when we're talking about boosting our immune system, is how can we avoid getting one of these sicknesses this year? And the first one I want to talk about is a fever. So when you talk about the body's intelligent design, the fever is the best example. Your body is so smart, it turns up its own temperature. That's genius, 
That's genius. It cooks out bacteria. It cooks out viruses. Viruses can't replicate above 100 degrees. So when you take a Tylenol and you lower the fever, you're allowing the virus to keep replicating. It's so incredibly smart and intelligent. But what have people led us to believe? Oh, it's dangerous. And can it get to a dangerous level? Absolutely, right? But very, very rarely. What? 104, I'd say, 104, 105. I mean, I don't own a thermometer, so I, I don't think that there's any fever that's too dangerous. And I'm about to share a quote from like, what the American Academy of Pediatrics guideline is. And they said even, even if it's high, it's not a concern, unless your child has a history of seizures or they have a chronic disease, even if it's high. Uh, but this is your body's intelligent design, and it's the best possible example of it. But the makers of Tylenol have led us to believe that when you have a fever, what do you got to do? Oh my gosh, you got to get it down. Life-threatening, right? But I don't know anybody, and sure there are people, and we have nurses in the room that have seen it in hospitals, and, and things have happened where a fever gets too high. But for the most part, I don't know many people who have ever run into this problem, and the fever got too high, and it, and it caused an issue. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, what they said is, this is a quote directly from them. They said, fever is not an illness. Rather, it's a symptom of sickness and is usually a positive sign that the body is fighting infection. Fevers generally do not to be, need to be treated with medication. The fever may be important in helping your child fight the infection. Even higher temperatures are not in themselves dangerous or significant unless your child has a history of seizures or chronic disease. Now, did you guys know that that's what the American Academy of Pediatricians, that's what their official statement was on this? Did you guys know that? Most people know. Do you think your pediatrician even knows that that's what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends? Yeah, my pediatrician told me that years ago. He did? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if they, can't, if they can't hold down fluids and liquids. And we have some patients who, uh, that's exactly what they've done, is they, they watch it, and it, when the child, if the child can't hold down liquids, they get them to the hospital. And then when they get there, these are patients who, who are pretty educated on their, their health and their, um, their rights and things like that. And when they get there, they say, we just want an IV. We don't want a medication. We don't want this. We just want an IV. You can tell them what you want when you get there. The problem is that most people just don't know what they need or what they want when they get there. But what I would say is that you know, a lot of pediatricians probably do know this when you're talking to the pediatrician. Where you're going to hear a lot about this is from other moms, other parents, Facebook groups, things like that, or your friend that says, oh my gosh, your child had a fever and you didn't take him to the hospital? That's neglect. We're going to call DCF, or you know, whatever. But that's where you're going to hear a lot of this from, not actually from the research or from the literature. Another thing is what most people do when they get a fever or they get a flu, they're going to take something for the pain. And what they found with you know, acetaminophen and aspirin is that it not only doesn't shorten the duration of the sickness, it actually suppresses your body's ability to fight the infection. It suppresses your body's ability to produce white blood cells. And they've done a few studies of this. The first one showed that aspirin and Tylenol acetaminophen su suppressed production of antibodies and actually increased your cold symptoms. So what do you want to do when you get a cold? You don't want to take anything. You want to let your body run its course. And we're going to talk about the top 10 steps later, things that you can do. But for the most part, they're not going to make a huge difference at that point either. These are things that you should be doing every single day to make sure that you never get the fever, the cold, or the flu in the first place. Another one they did was in test tube studies. And it showed that aspirin suppressed the ability of white blood cells to actually destroy the bacteria. So it's shutting down your immune system, and it's hampering its function. And then the last one showed that several pain relievers, including, once again, aspirin and ibuprofen, actually inhibited white cell production of antibodies by up to 50%. Okay, And so that is a big deal when it comes to getting a cold and a flu. And if it's a big deal to you, whether it lasts five days or it lasts seven days, don't take anything. Now, if you get to the point where you are just in unbearable pain, listen to your body. Right? If there's something that you can't get through without Tylenol or ibuprofen, it might be more serious. Head to the hospital if you feel like you need to. Listen to your body. But for the most part, fight 
through these things, and you're going to be better off in the future and stronger. Another study, one more study, this was from CBS News. Uh, they found that flu-like symptoms were found to be caused by the influenza virus at most 17% of the time and at as little as 3%. So a lot of times we think that it's the flu because we we're, we're, you know, have malaise, we're very tired, we have achy joints, we have a fever, we're throwing up. But it could be a ton of other bacteria or viruses, and a lot of them are viral, uh, and it could be a lot of other things. So what do we do? We think, well, okay, 17%, that's still pretty often. What am I going to do? I, I still don't want to take those chances. I'm going to go out and get a flu shot, right? So that's going to introduce the flu virus into me, and then even my 17% chances are going to go down quite a bit, right? But that's not the, not the case with flu shots. Flu shots. So the CDC announced last year's flu batch, last, or last year's flu vaccine, 23% effective. Now that was in January, 23% effective. Now guess what they're promoting again this year? Oh, it's going to be a lot better. Oh, it's going to be a lot stronger. Oh, make sure you get your flu shot, right? Everybody's got to have it. 23% effective when the virus is only causing the symptoms 17% of the time. I don't know the math of that, but a quarter of 17, it's 4% actually. It's 4%. So 4% that you're going to be helped by getting a flu shot last year. Now you think, okay, well maybe it's just last year's, the year before we're, we're better. 2012, 2013, 56% effective. So basically, if you flip a coin, you have, a you have the same chances of preventing the flu as you have of getting a flu shot. And these flu shots are live attenuated viruses. The inhaled ones are live viruses. The other ones are dead viruses. They have massive implications on your long-term immune health. So they're not effective, and they have huge implications on your long-term immune health. So but that was in January, 23% last year. By February, they lowered it to 18 and 15% among kids. And who do they push it amongst? Kids, pregnant people, and the elderly. Right? Those are three categories that they've proven to be not effective. And some of you guys have heard my story recently that a patient called in two Saturdays ago. I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm not doing too good. She's pregnant. She's six months pregnant. She said, I'm not doing too good. I got the flu shot, and I got Bell's palsy immediately. So if you guys have heard of Bell's palsy, it's a neurological condition where half your face loses motor control. Now, she also told me she had numbness. That's not part of Bell's palsy. That's an additional thing. So she had multiple neurological conditions directly caused by the flu shot. We had another patient that was here at the same time, and I told her the story. And she said, my sister-in-law just got a flu shot and went into labor immediately afterward. And it was the second time that that had happened. The first time it was premature labor. The second time, at least, it was full term. But these flu shots in pregnant women, the flu shots still contain mercury that's being shared with your bloodstream and the baby's bloodstream. It's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And now this patient, she works in the healthcare field. She didn't have a choice. She doesn't support flu shots, but she didn't have a choice according to her. We have some patients, maybe in the room, maybe not, that wear a mask at work. Right? She said that it's her, it's her scarlet letter because she has to walk around with a mask because she doesn't get the flu shot, but it's worth it to her to not have that virus put in her body. So that's the flu shot. Obviously, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, according to the Cochrane Database, too, who the Cochrane Database is the gold standard when it comes to research. The gold standard. They don't do the studies. They analyze the studies. So they analyze every study that's out there, and they will release what's the gold standard to be used in, in healthcare. And what they looked at is they found that 100 people have to be vaccinated in order for one person to be helped. It's the, actually the exact same numbers as what we looked at at the last talk or two talks ago, the numbers for what Lipitor needed to be effective. 100 people needed to take Lipitor for one person to be helped when you really look at the hard numbers. Now, that's not what the pharmaceutical company is going to tell you, but that's what the research shows I don't know. Well, I don't know that the effectiveness is any different uh, theoretically, uh, but just when they measure those categories, you know, if you measure men, women, kids, adults, they're all going to have different effectiveness levels, but I don't know what the mechanism would be. The reason they push them on, on those groups of people more is because they're, they say that they're more immune, uh, immunosuppressed, more immunodeficient, like the elderly and children especially, that they, their immune systems are weaker and so they need this flu shot to strengthen their immune system. That's why they're pushed so hard in those categories. 
Uh, number two, antibiotics. This is another one that I'm very passionate about because I've taken probably more than any of you. Um, a lot of people have done antibiotics for like months and years though, so I, maybe not, but I've done a lot of them. And what they do is they destroy the gut lining. They destroy the gut lining, which is in, in the, the first barrier of defense, and lead to a lifetime of immune problems. Okay, so they're gonna lead to things like colds and coughs and flus, but we're not really talking about those right now. We're talking about things like cancer, autoimmune conditions, these longer term immune diseases because your gut lining is destroyed by the antibiotics. They've also now created antibiotic resistant superbugs, which are incredibly dangerous. And you know, antibiotic usage used to be incredibly, incredibly prevalent. You're still gonna get it if you go in for an infection, oftentimes, most times. But really, you can read this, this quote here from the associate director of the CDC, and he said that for a long time there have been newspaper stories and magazine articles that asked the end of antibiotics, question mark, well, now I would say you can change the title to the end of antibiotics, period. Okay, so the use of antibiotics is starting to decline because we're noticing what all it's doing. But here's the scary thing is you might say, well, you know, I use antibiotics, but it's you know, about once a year. It's not very often, so I'm not too concerned about it. But the other concern is that they're now finding antibiotics in the water supply. They're definitely in the meat supply. Over 70% of our antibiotics in our country are used in our livestock. Because what do you do when you get sick cows? You feed them a bunch of grain so they get fat quicker, make more money for the farmer. They get sick quicker just like people do. You feed them antibiotics to keep them healthier longer so you can keep them alive. Then you kill them, then you feed them to us. And then we eat those antibiotics. So you gotta be concerned with those two that you're getting from other areas. Number three, cancer. This is another topic that we could, we could spend the whole day on this. And we have, you know, some of you have been to our cancer killers workshop that we've had the last couple years where we talk about cancer the entire day. But it's 41.24% of men and women born today, which is crazy, right? And we know that cancer is an immune system dysfunction. And what that number's expressed as, that 41%, I'm gonna switch sides so I don't block you, Charity. <laughs> what that number can be expressed as is one in two men and one in three women. Okay, and that, I mean, those are, those are mind-blowing <laughs> statistics, literally mind-blowing statistics. So when we get to the top 10 action steps that you can do to boost your immune system, who cares about a cold, right? When people are dying from cancer, who cares about the flu? You, yeah, we wanna prevent those, but don't we wanna prevent this more? Isn't this more important? So when we get to the top 10 action steps, don't go home and do those today so that you don't get the sniffles next week. Go home and do them so you don't get this in 20 years. Number four, autoimmune diseases. This is one of the fastest categories of disease that is on the rise. It's over 26 million Americans confirmed. They estimate that it's over 50 million total with autoimmune conditions. This is when your immune system, so your defense system, can't recognize an invader from yourself. It can't recognize self from non-self. This is kind of like, you know, maybe we're getting more into like a futuristic movie like uh, Terminator or something where we've got robots as soldiers and you've all seen the movie where they, they all turn on us, right? And they all start fighting us. That would be an autoimmune thing. I don't know a lot about those movies, but that would be autoimmunity when it all turns on you and starts attacking you. So it starts attacking your own tissue. It might attack your joints. That's rheumatoid arthritis. It might attack your, um, let's see, it might attack your... What? Someone said your thyroid, Hashimoto's. It might attack your hair. It might attack your eyes. It might attack any tissue of your body, but it shouldn't be attacking itself. That's autoimmune conditions. And medical research proves that vaccination can be a cause of autoimmune disease. This is not controversial. This is not anything that anybody can argue with. There's a guy that wrote all, he literally has written over 25 textbooks on autoimmune conditions. He's written all the textbooks that are used in all the medical schools in the United States, he's written the textbook, and he just came out recently, this is very, very recent, they just came out and said that there is beyond a shadow of a doubt that vaccines cause autoimmune diseases. And it's not in everybody, I've been vaccinated, right? But there's four categories of people who are, um, uh, who are more susceptible to vaccine-induced autoimmune conditions. So you gotta do the research, you gotta look it up. I, I can send you the information, I'd be happy to. But this guy, like I said, he is the, the world's leading authority on autoimmune conditions. And if you read some of these quotes, they link them directly to the vaccines. 
And number five, vaccines. And this is another thing that we could talk about the entire day. This is the last thing we're going to talk about before we take a quick break. And it's also a very, very heated topic, right? Uh, a lot of people have a strong opinion one way or the other, and I'm one of them, okay? So I'm not saying that you have to have my opinion. You know, I, I like to tell people all the time that, you know, my sisters vaccinate their kids. Uh, a lot of my good friends have chosen not to, but I haven't gotten to my sisters yet. But we don't vaccinate our kids, and I want to show you why, because it's all fact-based and research-based. It's not a philosophical reason. And if you look at just the history of vaccines, to me, this chart really shows it all. This is the rate, the United States mortality rates for these different diseases. Okay, so this is in 1900. A lot of people are dying. Diphtheria, killing a lot of people. A lot of these things that are, are you know, helped through just proper sanitation, things like that. Uh, so they're all starting to decline, 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 decline. Down here, they're virtually zero. That's when the whooping cough vaccine is put in place. That's when the measles vaccine is put into place. Okay, and you hear things like we eradicated polio. Well, polio has pretty much the exact same symptoms as spinal meningitis, which is still around. Uh, these vaccines, a lot of times, were introduced after the diseases were already massively, massively, massively on the decline. And so what do you hear about now? Well, you don't hear about these diseases quite as often, unless there's an outbreak, then it's gonna be all over the news, right? But you don't hear about these diseases, but what do you hear about autoimmune disease? You hear about shingles. Shingles is skyrocketing because people are getting the chickenpox vaccine. They're not being exposed to chickenpox at a young age the way that they're naturally supposed to. It's artificial immunity as opposed to natural immunity. And what it does, when you think back about those three layers of defense, when you introduce a vaccine, it's skipping over the innate immune response and going right to the adaptive immune response. So it does stimulate the production of antibodies. There's no question about that. It's easily measured that a vaccine for chickenpox is going to stimulate antibodies that your body's going to fight against chickenpox. But there's no research to show that those increased antibodies decreases your chances of getting chicken pox. Getting a little too scientific here, but there's no real research showing the efficacy and the efficiency of these vaccines. And so if you look at something like measles, the measles vaccine introduced right there, then you look at something like this, you know, because last year there was a big outbreak and it was all over the news. And this is how I make my, my decisions, is this is an easy choice for me. Zero deaths in the last 10 years due to measles. That's not controversial, that came from the CDC. These are just facts and figures. It's not even a study, this is just statistical facts. Deaths due to measles vaccines, 108. And they estimate that vaccine adverse reactions are grossly underreported. They estimate that 10% are reported at the, at the most. They're grossly underreported, but still 108, 10 a year have been reported for the last 10 years. So that alone makes my decision there. We've got a lot of information on this. this is obviously a very, very in-depth topic, um, and, and it's something that, you know, it's just open up the discussion if you're curious about it. Have the discussion, start doing some research, and don't go off emotion, go off fact and go off science, and you're, you're going to know whether or not this decision or what decision is going to be the right one for you. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.